Hey, what's up, everybody? It's Ned Bellavance, Ned1313 on Twitter, and welcome to the Daily Check-In for July 10th, 2020. It's Friday. That means it's Vault Certification Friday. We're going to be talking about HashiCorp Vault, and specifically, this is a continuation of the Vault Certification Objectives. I started Objective 2 last Friday, and it was all about creating policies for Vault. And we didn't get through all of the enabling objectives that summarize into that terminal objective. So this week, uh, we're going to be finishing that objective. I'm going to put a card up here for the previous video. In case you didn't watch that yet, this is not going to make as much sense. So go back and watch that first video that covers the first three uh, enabling objectives for Vault. And then you can watch this one, which will round everything out. Um, so that's what the topic is for day today, one housekeeping item, real simple. Uh, I have two courses on HashiCorp Vault that are available on Pluralsight, and I actually got another uh, bucket of 30-day passes that are available. So if you would like a 30-day pass to Pluralsight, you don't have to take my course. You can take whatever you want. They've got like 8,000 courses or whatever. It's a 30-day, no strings attached, no credit card required pass. So if that is of interest to you, just hit me up on Twitter. It's Ned1313 or send me a message through LinkedIn and I will send you a code that you can redeem for that 30-day pass. So that's the only thing I just wanted to mention. Before we get into today's topic, I want to check in with you. How you doing? It's Friday. Friday's pretty awesome. I'm kind of pumped that it's Friday. It's been uh, it's been a really busy week coming off of a vacation. You know, you're always just throwing back in the mire. I'm sure if you were on some kind of break or vacation in the past week, I think a lot of people were getting back into the swing of things in the following week is well, it can be a little bit dicey, it can be a little bit challenging. So it's probably nice to know that tomorrow, you can put your feet up, take a break, and you know, get ready for the, the next week. Or hey, maybe you got a vacation next week. I'm, I'm hoping you do. I have one at the end of this month and I'm very much looking forward to it. So with that out of the way, let's talk about HashiCorp Vault policies. Now, where, where did we get to last time? Well, the high level objective, the terminal objective for policies is creating and using policies in Vault. And the previous video, we covered the first three objectives, uh, sub-objectives or terminal objectives, and not terminal, enabling objectives, and they were illustrate the value of vault policy. So you know, what is it? Why would you use it? Describe vault policy syntax when it comes to paths. So just remember, everything in vault is a path. So if you want to assign permissions, you can reference a path and then grant certain permissions or actions that someone can take on that path. And the next one was describe vault policy syntax capabilities. And we started going down the capabilities path. And I think we got through all of the capabilities, those specifically. So that's things like being able to read, write, update, delete, and also the special sudo action. We, we covered all of those capabilities in the previous post. So that's kind of where we stopped. And I said, hey, we actually didn't get to everything in capabilities. There's like, there's this other little bit more, which can be kind of confusing. And I recommend playing around with it a little bit. And it's this idea of fine grained parameters within your policy. What do those parameters allow you to do? There's three kinds. There's required parameters. So these are parameters that you absolutely have to specify within the context of that path. So if you're going to be adding a value to that path, these parameters are required. So if you think about like a like a key value secret that you're adding to a path, you might want specific parameters to always be present in whatever that secret is. So you can say these are the required parameters. You can also be a little uh, prescriptive around what parameters you allow by setting allowed parameters. And within those allowed parameters, you can specify the allowed values for those parameters. So you can either say allow these specific values. So maybe you're talking about a secret where the value could be one, two, or three. And so you can say it can be one, two, or three, and that's it. Those are all the allowed values for this allowed parameter. So you can really start getting down to fine grained stuff. and 
if you think about how Vault is probably built on the back end, I don't have deep knowledge of this. I didn't write it, but you got to imagine that they're using policies and these fine grained required allowed. And there's one more we didn't get to yet denied parameters to assign policies to things outside of secrets. So things like authorization or authentication, rather things like some of the system properties, you can use policies to do this fine grain kind of stuff and then define what could go in a particular system parameter. Okay, so they're probably using their own policies system to control some of the aspects of vault. It all kind of makes sense. So that last uh, fine grained option is denied parameters. So these are parameters that you will not allow to be in this setting. And the use cases are probably kind of weird for that one, like most deny rules. But if you if you never wanted a particular parameter to be in a secret, you could put it in a deny there and you can't put that parameter in. So in addition to determining whether or not someone can write to a policy, you can also determine what they can write to that policy, what they can write to that path through a policy through these fi fine grained controls when it comes to capabilities. Okay, so that's I think that rounds out all the capability stuff. Uh, there's two more things that I want to talk about before I get to the last of these uh, enabling objectives. There are two policies that exist out of the box when you spin up vault. They're the default policy and the root policy. So what is the default policy? What does that do? The default policy is attached to any token by default. You can exclude certain tokens. You can say certain tokens don't get the default policy. They get this one specific policy and never the default policy. That's fine. But if you don't exclude it, it gets the default policy by default because it's default policy. And you can alter the contents of that default policy. So if there's just some broad thing that you want tokens to have access to or don't want tokens to have access to, although in fairness, when it comes to permissions in Vault, it's deny by default and allow, you know, by explicit allowing. So it's kind of like firewalls in that regard. And I think I said that last time, it's going to be denied by default. But if you wanted to include a few allowed things within your default policy, you could do that. And then any token that gets created that doesn't specifically exclude the default policy would get that policy. That seems kind of useful. The other policy, and this one is really important, is the root policy. And the root policy can do anything. It can do anything within Vault. It can destroy Vault, it can destroy secrets, remove authentication things, alter audit logs. Like the root policy is kind of a big deal. And the only thing that gets it out of the box is the root token. So when you create, when you spin up Vault, it has to give you a way to get in. And it does that by giving you a root token. And that root token has the root policy assigned to it. So you can start setting things up. As soon as you get into Vault, the first thing you should usually do is set up an additional user through some authentication and revoke the root token. And, and that essentially removes the root policy from being assigned to anyone or anything which means you don't have that God power sitting there anymore, which is kind of dangerous when you think about it. Now, you can't alter the root policy and you can't delete the root policy. It is there no matter what, but it, you have to explicitly assign it to a token in order for it to take effect. And generally speaking, the only tokens that are going to have it are root tokens you've issued to do something very important or attaching it to an admin token that needs to do something very specific and important and then revoking that token as soon as possible because that person's running in God mode as long as they have that token with that root policy attached. So that's probably everything in terms of those two. The last um, enabling objective there was craft a vault policy based on requirements. There are definitely going to be a number of different use cases out there that you might want to consider when it comes to running vault. So let me take you through a few quick examples of some use cases that might be out there. Now, let's say you want to delegate permissions to a junior admin for configuring authentication for LDAP. Okay, so 
what you know is that if the authentication method LDAP is enabled, it's enabled on a path and it has a configuration portion of that path. So you can create a policy for your junior admins that gives them restricted permissions to that config path. So you would want to experiment and figure out how to do that, how to write that policy. But that's an example of how you might want to use policy to give that junior admin a little bit of uh, a little bit of leash, but not too much. Another example of, of a use case is you want to grant the applications team. Let's say you have a team of app developers. You want to grant them access to all versions of secrets. Now we didn't get into this, but key value stores can have multiple versions. Uh, if you're using key value store version two, you can have multiple versions of a secret that has to do with not only the secret path, but also the metadata for the secret. You need access to both. So you might want to know that if you're trying to create that policy that the person you're creating that policy for will need access to both. And then finally, what's another good use case? So I just came up with these uh, real quick, but let's say you want to require an application to include certain fields when writing parameters to a path. Okay. Well, we talked about fine grained parameter control and you can do that through required parameters. And you could even get even more restrictive around exactly what values can go into those required parameters. So those are three use cases. Think in your mind about other potential use cases, because those are the kind of questions that are going to trip you up and then try to actually run through some of those scenarios on a vault dev instance. So you can get comfortable with how policies are crafted and how capabilities are added and some of the other more advanced features within policies. I don't think you have to be an expert, but you have to have thought through these use cases if you want to get through the certification. So that's all I have for today. Thank you so much for watching. We'll be back on Monday where I'm going to talk about my ongoing Python project and I haven't made a lot of progress. So maybe I can make a little progress this weekend. Uh, but that that does it for me. I hope you have a great weekend. Thank you for tuning in, you know, share and subscribe if you don't mind. And I will see you next week. Stay healthy and stay safe, everyone.